And no, nobody, obviously, nobody cares about critical infrastructure right now. You in light of oh, yeah. it's, it's hardly hardly a topic at all uh, out well, there in the broader space. Welcome. You found Scythe's CISO Stressed podcast, and we're a bi-weekly look at all of the issues, events, and quite frankly, whatever strikes CISO's fancy. And today we've brought in a guest that I'm particularly excited about chatting with because like my journey, uh, his journey has also been through meandering the halls of DC federal government, as well as now focusing in the private sector on back, kind of looking back at the public sector. But uh, Nick Anderson is Chief Information Security Officer for Public Sector at Lumen Technologies, as well as a non-resident senior fellow with the Cyber Statecraft Initiative at the Atlantic Council. With that mouthful of an introduction, Nick, welcome to the show. Yeah, thanks so much. And Nick, we both, I guess our first introduction was back when you were working uh, with the last administration and talking about some of the uh, security challenges that were facing critical infrastructure. And uh, I think ransomware has brought some of that into the news. And if it didn't, then there was a recent executive order that brought a focus of cybersecurity, both at the, well, at the federal level, but also with critical infrastructure. Uh, how, how have you enjoyed unpacking that 30 page executive order? Yeah, I, I, I don't know what the record is for length of an executive order, but this one, this one has to be, has to be up there. Uh, but yeah, no, I've actually, not planned at all for this. I've got my like printed out copy of it here. I've been annotating <laughs> things all over the left and right hand side and looking at kind of risk and opportunity space. It's been it's been fun. Um, and no nobody obviously nobody cares about critical infrastructure right now. You know, in light of oh, yeah. it's, it's hardly hardly a topic at all uh, out well, there in the broader space. You know, and I liked one of the things y'all did for the Atlantic Council, uh, where it was kind of what I env envisioned, like mystery science theater, where y'all went through and brought in several subject matter experts and just offered insights, commentary, and kind of picked it apart. But uh, which, if anyone hasn't had a chance to look at, go to the Atlantic Council's website. They've got a link to it and it becomes interactive. But uh, how fun was that? And I'm going to use fun loosely, but for a policy nerd like me, that's kind of like my dream of going like, wow, I'm giving you feedback almost in real time as you're reading through something. I mean, did you take a little bit of artistic license or dial up perhaps the snark for some of it? <laughs> or did you have to dial it back? Well, you know, it's, it's, so, it's so fun working with that group of people. Uh, and I think if anybody gets the award, for the most fun comments to read throughout it all, it's probably Wendy Nather, you know, who's the, she's the you know, head of the CISO advisory services. I think it was at, it was Duo. Now that's all part of all part of Cisco. Um, you know, Wendy, a she's just a brilliant mind. Anyway, and she's she's fun. She's fun to talk to, but she had some fantastic comments there. So I mean, just being able to see her and Chris and Katie and everybody sort of in that group all collaborating together. And to see where like the different vantage point that everybody's coming at, uh, coming from rather, that's that's really that's really neat because everybody has kind of a different perspective, and there's so much to unpack in that executive order. It is just wild uh, from you know, kind of encapsulating the S bomb initiatives that NTIA has been working on for a couple of years, and all the great work they've been doing, to you know uh, EDR requirements and instant response playbooks and cloud requirements. I mean, there's just there's a lot there. Um, so it was a good opportunity to kind of get that group together, and I love I love working with the Atlanta Council folks. They're, they're they're great. It's always it's always great when you get in a room with people that are so smart that the kind of the argument and the dialogue helps you to further refine your thinking about things. It's it's a great group. Well, and you bring up a good point in talking about um, opportunities for collaboration because I know. Well, from my past experiences working in 
uh, with City of Atlanta. And when you're tackling security challenges, having that brainstorm. So as a CISO, remembering that you're not doing this alone, that you're driving things, but that there are brilliant people with perhaps different perspectives within your organization and outside of your organization. And how have you seen that now that you're back, kind of say back, but you're with Lumen outside of the government, how do you build that within an organization or with within both Lumen, but also with others that you work with? Yeah, I think I've been, I've been lucky. And I think it's whether, whether it was, you know, when I was earlier in my career and sort of wanting to get sort of mentorship guidance on, you know, how I should think about my career and what some of my own gaps were and how I should grow and stretch. Um, or now in my current role, you know, as a CISO again, um, I've never reached out to anybody in our community and ever had somebody just flatly turn me away or ignore me. If I reached out and said, hey, I saw something that you wrote up. I was, you know, at a conference that you were at. I was watching a video that you put out. I really would love just to talk to you about that. I've never had anybody turn me away, like not not once. It has literally never happened. Um, a, a, because if somebody's taking the time to talk about something publicly, it's generally something they enjoy and they're excited about and they're happy to share, you know, to share more and to share their perspective. And B, I think we just come from such a collaborative, open community, just the way it was set up. I mean, there's little sacks and pockets of people that are just uh, full of all kinds of uh, all kinds of negative energy sometimes, uh, for sure. But by and large, everybody's all about sort of giving back and having those conversations. So I think it's I think it's a lot of it. It's just getting to the point where you feel comfortable sort of leaping out and saying, hey, I don't know as much about this. I need some help, or I just need somebody to bounce an idea off of. Can I reach out? So it was always great to be able to do that on the federal government side. You know, when I was on the government side, people in the industry were always very forthright in what they thought uh, we were getting right and what they thought we were getting wrong. And now that I'm back out on the private sector side, sort of that community of collaboration has just continued. It's, it's great. Well, and I found it interesting that the, that, that was one or that intelligence sharing, that information sharing and collaborative approach really seemed to take, I mean, Grant, not as much as supply chain and SBOM, which was what, 2,000 of the 8,000 words of the executive order, but that kind of a common thread woven through was like, hey, let's share information. Let's build off each other. Let's have common frameworks for doing something. And that's one of the things at Scythe we've tried to do is through our uh, purple team framework and different workshops say, hey, we've gained some knowledge here, let's put it out in the community for free, that it was great to see that and building within the executive order. And again, and also the Atlantic Council's approach to com commenting on it. Yeah. Now, how, how do you work with, I mean, intelligence sharing, I find uh, some people like to, you know, we've spent a lot of time working on this particular piece of, information, maybe there's liability associated with it. Do you have to work to break through some of that to say, no, 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 by t sharing this information that you have, it's going to make the organization stronger, the security posture stronger and help us fight ransomware? Yeah, I mean, Intel, Intel sharing is not, you know, the panacea. You know, it's, it's not, it's not the thing that is going to cure everything that ails us in this broader community. It's absolutely essential to be able to share information. Um, but I think in a lot of ways, there's just as much, if not more to be gained, not from just government and industry information sharing, but from industry to industry, analytic collaboration and sharing. Um, so some of, the, I mean, some of that's gonna involve finding ways to get past things that are like company proprietary data and sort of navigating all the different uh, privacy frameworks that we have to deal with for protecting you know, customer information, uh, just in the same way that the federal government has you know, hurdles to overcome with sharing classified information and sharing it in a timely manner uh, with people where it's really going to derive value for how they're either strategically investing 
to you know counter threats over the horizon or operationally how they're going to secure their infrastructure. And that's where I think a lot of the, the real value is for threat information sharing is in kind of that strategic look. You know, the operational, the operational value of some of that threat intel is uh, I don't want to say it's negligible, but it's not it's not it's not the magic wand that somebody might think. Um, but understanding sort of strategic adversary intent and where you know where we're looking over the horizon, some of the threats, I do think that's value. You know, like in 2019, <clears throat> in 2019, uh, Dan Coates was then the director of national intelligence. And in the worldwide threat assessment that he delivered to the Hill, uh, he specifically highlighted, you know, the OD and I did, that you know, our adversaries, you know, nation state actors are seeking to hold our critical infrastructure at risk and are hoping to take advantage of some of those seams that we've created within these communities uh, to be able to exploit that at a time that they're choosing. Um, so it's a, that's a terrific example of we're you know, strategically saying to the world, we know this is going on, we know this is a problem, this is a call to invest strategically, to think holistically about that problem. That's, that's some of where it's valuable. And then giving additional context to critical infrastructure owner operators about how they can actually work to secure their infrastructure against these emerging threats. That's where it's less valuable. Um, well, absolutely. And, uh, you know, knowing what or how, if there are commonalities of uh, this is how we're seeing trends, uh, I know using MITRE attack framework and some of the others, building that out, but getting ahead of the curve so that uh, on one of our prior shows, we talked about kind of removing that low hanging fruit that as a CISO, if you're looking at your organization and saying, look, they had to burn a uh, zero day to get into our, to execute the ransomware, or the malware or the attack against us, that means now we know it. Now we know how to, how the attack is, we know how to defend and we know how to respond. So it seems like you're still building on the work from 2019, still fighting that fight. Oh yeah, absolutely. And it's, and like I said, it's, it's more than just in my mind, it's more than just government sharing to industry or in, in some instances, industry sharing to what feels like the black hole of government and, and never getting anything back. Um, I, I've been a government guy several times. Like I understand that's the perception. I understand why it is that way. Uh, and, and government has to do better. Um, but a lot of times that industry to industry information sharing about what's going on, understanding those commonalities that are there within threat vectors that are being exploited can be really, can be really valuable. You know, like our, our folks here internally, you know, at Lumen, we see a, a tremendous amount of traffic <laughs> that's out there, you know, across. I was going to say, know. I mean, y'all have what, 70% of the world's uh, internet traffic going through your infrastructure. I mean, I'd say y'all see a lot. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's, uh, so our, our Black Lotus Labs, they kind of, you know, forms that, that threat intelligence nucleus for us as a company. They're ingesting like 190 billion NetFlow sessions and 771 million DNS queries a day. I mean, that's that's a fantastic baseline of what normal and abnormal behavior looks like across 450,000 dedicated route miles of fiber in 60 something you know countries around the world. Um, so those are there are terrific opportunities there to be able to you know pair up with organizations like ours and say, what are you seeing? How is this normal? How is this abnormal? What are you seeing in an adjacent sector? What are we seeing within our, you know, within our customer segments? And again, some of that stuff has to be protected because of the types of customers that we're working with. Um, but there's absolutely opportunities there for collaboration and taking advantage of kind of the insights that someone like us can provide to further collaborate and deepen our understanding of what's happening in the threat environment. Well, and so what are some of the uh, pet projects or initiatives that uh, internally or that you're trying to kind of push forward within Lumen to build, lift that up to kind of get the message out that, hey, there's this information working together, we can build better? Well, I think a lot of it, a lot of it for us is kind of looking at what does, what does infrastructure of the future look like? 
you know, and a lot of that for, for us, you know, we think it's going it, to, we're going to see this greater push for edge compute and kind of pushing, you know, compute and processing to where it's closer to the end user. To, you know, our goal is, you know, to be able to have, you know, the vast majority of the country, you know, within five milliseconds for processing, um, you know, whatever their application is that they, that they want to host. That gives us a lot of great opportunities to be able to think about security at the edge, to be able to think about appropriate network segmentation, to be able to think about trust zones, and be able to think about you know how that extended that extended network <clears throat> you know, with processing at the edge can really be used as a tool for innovating around security as well, not just innovating around you know service delivery uh, and thinking about things like latency, which are incredibly important, but there's lots of opportunities to tackle those problems, you know, at the same at the same time. So we've got a we've got a ton of great services that we're providing, especially on the public sector side, uh, just because that's my pet. You know, here with here within Lumen, so I'll I'll, I'll shout out our own organization, um, where we're constantly thinking about, you know, we've got a new product that's entering into the Lumen portfolio. It's immediately how are we going to fit this into public sector? How can we make this available not just for federal? But for state, local, tribal, territorial governments as well, and all of the organizations that support them. Now, and that was what was fascinating about a lot of the talk on the executive order so far has been focused on the federal because that's the nature of an executive order, but realizing how the state, local, tribal, territorial, how all of that fits in, that they're using some of the same. Uh, funding sources, some of the same procurement structures. So if the feds ask for it, that's going to come in. Uh, from the CISO perspective, how difficult is that conversation of reminding people like, hey, let's let's keep all of these audiences uses, like let's bake it in from the beginning when we're developing this. Oh yeah, I mean the the bane of my existence as a state CISO was were all the competing compliance frameworks that I had to deal with uh, for all the federal the federal programs that came into a state level. Uh, so there's absolutely a huge a huge connection there. You know whether it was something that was you know, front of mind you know two plus years ago, like elections infrastructure and how that was going to be secured and how we were going to work with secretaries of state you know across across the nation and all the the local elections officials. To see just the criminal justice information system and I'm working with DOJ and the FBI for all of our public safety professionals out in the field to IRS and their 1075 standards for all of the you know tax entities that are in the states to you know uh, Mars E, which is a different compliance structure used by CMS and that applies to things like healthcare data. Uh, there's a tremendous amount of kind of intertwined nature between federal and state entities, and there's a tremendous amount of opportunity there. And we even see the states standing up and saying, yeah, hey, we're going to model some of our processes and procedures beyond just the compliance aspect. Uh, we're going to model some of our, our policies and procedures based off of the way that the federal government has taken that approach. So like there's not just Fed ramp now, now there's a state ramp, you know, that's because mm -hmm. they want to be able to look at that body of evidence as well and kind of be able to all the risk. Well, and it makes, I mean, we talk about one of the other um, pieces of legislation moving through Congress now is expanding the federal funding for state, local, uh, tribal, territorial, because we're asking these tiny little county governments, city governments that are just, in some cases, two people, maybe, for the entire county government, if that. I mean, there are places in Georgia where it was one, there was one person who did everything. So being it for them to be able to leverage the knowledge base at the federal level and say, okay, if y'all have been able to figure this out and get it right, mm -hmm. I can just kind of piggyback. But again, going back to that collaborative approach, I don't see that necessarily as a bad thing, as long as they understand exactly what they're signing on to, which is, which was the other thing going, you I don't know how many times I've had that conversation at the city or state level, even going, you know, that's not what that actually means, but like, let's, let's call, let's call the experts who can explain it to us a little bit better. And there was, and there was one thing that I, I did highlight in that Atlantic council, a uh, quick look that we did 
where I'm hopeful that you know there was a call out in the executive order for looking at all the different cybersecurity compliance requirements that are out there and sort of reconciling them and coming to a common way of, uh, of looking at cybersecurity compliance requirements. Um, if, if, if the federal government can crack that nut, but how people are taking NIST guidelines and then applying them within their individual environment and look at reconciling it from a contractual perspective uh, so we don't have competing compliance schemes out there, then hopefully that helps to flow down into state and locals and how they can how they can you know, gain back some of their resources and focus again and invest again in different emerging initiative areas so they're not having to constantly compete with all of the the CEDIS requirements, the IRS requirements, the CMS requirements, the just everything else <laughs> that they have to deal with. I mean, there was a good GAO report that was done you know, two years ago on just the burden that it placed in the National Association of State CIOs has highlighted that repeatedly, mm -hmm. just the burden that creates for state and local governments and having to comply with all of that. Well, exactly. And we like to end every uh, CISO stress kind of on a positive note. Uh, so now that we've talked about these poor state <laughs> governments and executive orders and all the challenges and collaboration, uh, but stress spelled backwards is desserts and dessert being a way to kind of cap off a meal in the day. What, are, what is something that you do to kind of cap off your day? It could be a dessert if you have a favorite. Um, I mean, you get bonus points in my book for anything chocolate uh, oriented, but how do you kind of take, cap off your day after you've had to have all these conversations and ponder these big issues? Well, you know, as bad as it's gonna sound, I'm, I'm not a huge desserts guy. Uh, only, Fair enough. only because I have exceptionally little self-control when it comes to these <laughs> of things. Uh, so I don't keep a whole lot of that in the, in the house, but I, I like just going out on my back patio, hanging out with a beer, hanging out with my family out there. And as they sort of start winding down for the night, I go right back to my phone and I start calling other people in our community that I know were also up late and have something mm -hmm. wrong with their, you know, wrong with them in their minds and just start having late night conversations, hanging out on the patio. You know, and taking that, that for me is late at night, it's dark. Now there's cicadas, you know, buzzing in the background. Uh, you know, I, that, that is my opportunity to kind of like unpack and unwind by griping and trying to solve the world's problems with other people. Well, even if it's virtually now. Exactly. And no, thank you for doing that. And I can certainly relate and hopefully catch, um, uh, Folks can listen in on to CISO Stressed the Assize YouTube channel. Find the audio versions on any of your favorite streaming channels. But Nick, where I can be found because I'm Lawyer Liz on Twitter. Uh, where can you be found if people want to get additional insights or follow up with you on any questions? Sure. So I'm I'm right there on on LinkedIn, of of course. If you if you look for me, uh, but I'm also on Twitter. I'm not as cool as Lawyer Liz. I'm just <laughs> M. N. M. Anderson, so a little, much less creative handle. Uh, but I'm right there, uh, and of course, I'm, I'm constantly throwing out stuff about what we're working on on LinkedIn and Twitter. Well, excellent. Well, thank you so much for your time today, and good luck with the uh, continue storming the castle and building better uh, with Lumen. And again, thanks to everyone for joining in on Sice. See so stressed. We'll catch you next time. And also uh, check out, be sure to check out our website, scythe.io, for the latest and greatest from the unicorn herd. I'm your host, Lawyer Liz. Catch you next time.